All right, one-dimensional kinematics, physics review for the regents. Uh, this is going to be pretty quick. This is indeed review. I encourage you to follow up on whatever content area you need extra help on because this, again, is just review. More or less, I'm going to run through this sheet here and try to clarify anything that I think is necessary in addition to the words here. So distance and displacement. The biggest difference here, distance is a scalar term, displacement is a vector term. Remember, vector terms require both magnitude and direction. Scalar only cares about magnitude, so directional information is not needed. Magnitude is a word that actually tends to throw kids off it shouldn't, but it does. Understand, it literally just means size, value, amount. It is just a way of saying, okay, let me give you an example. If something is traveling 25 meters per second north, the magnitude is literally 25 meters per second, the amount. North is the directional side of it, okay? Uh, the other difference between distance and displacement is simply distance is cumulative. It's the total distance traveled. You're going to add everything up. I don't care if you went left, right, up, or down. Every meter you traveled gets included in the sum. Displacement direction does matter. And the easiest way of thinking about it, it is the most efficient route from point A to point B, with point B being where you finished. You go around the block. You go to the opposite corner of the block. Your distance is down one side of the street, then the next street, add it up. Displacement is the diagonal from where you started to where you finished. That does mean displacement can be zero if distance is something more than zero. Let's say you do a lap around the track. If you finish where you started, the most efficient route to where you finished would be going nowhere. So your displacement is zero. But your distance is more than zero. You did the entire lap, so 400 meters. Meters are the units for displacement. That's the standard unit, at least. Speed and velocity. Also, the biggest difference is that speed is scalar. Direction does not matter. Velocity is vector. Direction does matter. The other thing to pay attention in here is I screwed up this equation. Average speed over distance over time. I carried this over twice and did not mean to. This should really say average velocity is displacement over time. So that should be clear enough on how these are different. Speed is distance over time. Go around the track, take one lap. Your speed will be the 400 meters that you travel divided by your time. Displacement is zero, though, so your velocity is zero. Now, in reality, after the beginning of the year, we tend to not care about the difference between these two. For the most part, part, for the most part in physics, speed and velocity are used interchangeably. It's kind of unfortunate, but it's true. You'll often hear the physics teachers use the word speed instead of velocity and velocity instead of the word speed doesn't necessarily mean they're actually equal, but they do tend to be equal. So we tend to not really worry about the fact that it's distance over time for speed or displacement over time for velocity. But in the beginning of the year, uh, especially on your regents, when you are uh, specifically being asked what is the velocity or the speed when you are given both distance and displacement, you should know the difference. Also, measured in meters per second. Acceleration, the rate in which the velocity changes. Remember, velocity is both magnitude and direction, so acceleration could imply that the object is increasing or decreasing in speed, or it could imply that its direction is changing. Objects don't naturally turn left or right, so if something is turning, something needed to turn it. That's why there's an acceleration there. It's a meter per second squared, or a meter per second per second, and the equation is change in velocity over time. When an object is in free fall, it's when the only force acting on it is gravity. So as soon as it leaves the ground, your hand, the object, whatever, it's in free fall. It doesn't actually need to be traveling down to be in free fall. So if you throw a ball straight up, the moment it leaves your hand, it is in free fall. On its way up, the acceleration due to gravity is slowing it down until it gets to its highest point. But then on its way down, that acceleration due to gravity is increasing its speed. Keep that in mind. Motion graphs, super important, very common in physics for us to identify information via graphs. We teach graphs often in the beginning of the year when we're describing motion, but recognize the tools for motion graphs are often used for all graphs. There are some things you can just straight up remember. I'd rather you understand the method. So two things that you should always look at, what is the slope of a graph and what is the area representing? So if I have a distance time graph and I have a straight line here, my slope actually does mean something. Remember, slope is rise over run or change in y over change in x. Well, it's still true here, but now we have some physical information. It's not change in y, it's change in d because d is the y value. 
It's not changing x, it's changing time, because time is the x value. Well, distance over time, or changing distance over time, means something. And it's going to be average velocity. So the slope of a distance time graph is actually average velocity. Now, if you're going to do the same kind of analysis for a velocity time graph, it means something over there too, believe it or not. So if I were to put a slope in here, uh, let's say I've got a shallow slope, but it's a nice straight line. My slope means something. Well, it's change in y, change in velocity, over change in x, change in time. What is change in velocity over time? That's acceleration. So the slope of a velocity time graph is acceleration. Do you need to memorize that? Uh, you can, but I'd rather you know how to do that. Change in y over change in x means something. Area also means something for a velocity time graph. Area is always going to be the y value times the x value. Now, of course, there's a triangle here, so we'll have to cut it in half, but more or less it's the y variable, v, times the x variable, t. Well, v times t means something. Yep, displacement. So you could remember that area is displacement, or you could recognize that all you got to do is figure out, well, what is the y value times the x value? Does it represent something? If it does, what does it represent? Another good example is a forced displacement graph when we go to deal with work. The area under a forced displacement graph is work, because f times d is work. I'll cover that during that unit, though. So to recap, or if you are one of those ones that just likes to straight up memorize, acceleration is the slope of a velocity time graph. Displacement is the area for a velocity time graph. Velocity is the slope for a displacement time graph. And finally, velocity is the area under the acceleration time graph curve. I also have some types of motion mapped out here, drawn out here for uh, just a better example to walk you through one step by a time. If we have an object traveling at constant velocity, it means every single time it'll travel the same distance. So we're going to have these dots by themselves equidistant this is known as a ticker tape model if i were to have a distance time graph speed time graph and acceleration time graph for the same motion it would all look different because they each represent something slightly different remember a distance time graph represents or the slope represents velocity well if the velocity is constant i need a slope of some constant value a speed time graph the slope is acceleration if the velocity is constant we have no acceleration so we're looking for a nice horizontal line and it will be equivalent to the average velocity the whole way through. Finally, again, as we already said, there's no acceleration. So for an acceleration time graph, we're going to have a slope of zero at the zero spot. Continuing with an example, what if we have a car starting from rest and then accelerating forward? As we go throughout time, the distance gets further and further and further and further apart. So we're getting an exponential relationship. You can see that mathematically by looking at d equals one half at squared, or you can recognize it conceptually. If we're accelerating, that means the velocity should be changing. So for distance time graph, which represents velocity on the slope, we should be seeing a changing slope, and that's a curve. The tangent at every spot would represent the velocity at that spot. So we're finishing with pretty high speed here, and we have pretty low speed in the beginning. Or actually, we have zero speed in the beginning if we do the tangent at the initial spot. A speed time graph represents acceleration. Again, constant acceleration. That means we're going to have a constant slope. Finally, an acceleration time graph, we're going to have a horizontal line representing the value of that acceleration when we get there. All right, let's describe motion wave equations. This is actually the bulk of this whole unit. If you can master this, you're going to be able to nail a lot of your physics problems. Don't forget the other two that we included. Uh, average velocity is displacement over time. It's really change in D over time, so I always toss the delta in there. And then A is change in velocity over time. These five will help you identify everything else. And all you really have to do, the secret formula to this, is to identify three of the five kinematic variables for every problem. You find three of them, you can solve for every other variable. What are the kinematic variables? Well, we have distance or displacement. We have time. We have initial velocity. We have final velocity. And we have acceleration. If you can identify three of these, you can find all the rest using one of these or two of these five equations. A good example is if I take a rock and I drop it from rest and I know it falls for three seconds, I can solve for how far it fell. I can figure out how fast it was falling by the time it hit the ground, everything. Well, it doesn't seem like it can because all I said is I took a rock and it fell for three seconds. Don't forget about the hidden information. If I let it drop, I know it must start with an initial velocity of zero. If it's falling, I know there must be an acceleration due to gravity acting on it, 9.81 meters per second squared. Now I could use, uh, say, this equation to find distance, or maybe this equation to find 
uh, velocity at the end if I know distance, or this equation to find velocity at the end since I know time. Uh, all sorts of stuff we can do. We can solve for everything else. Last thing I want to point out is V1 and V2 are all are often self-included with average velocity or delta V. So sometimes you can get away with just writing four things down if you know delta V and you know average V. All right, well, I hope this is a good taste on review for kinematics. I highly encourage you to check out the kinematics review worksheet video as well where I go through a bunch of different problems uh, in a little bit more uh, tangible uh, pertaining to those problems for this review. Thank you.